we're in for a treat now, everybody. Um, as you all know, today it's Halloween, and we have Claude Doyle here from the Museum of Country Life. Um, I'm coming to you from Mulrani today, a little village on the shores of Clue Bay. Uh, anyone who's joining us here, you're very, very welcome. We're delighted to have you with us. You can't be here in person, but it's lovely to have you here virtually. Um, all of us here at the Dark Skies Park, we wanted to really enjoy the time you have with us here today. So I think the last conversation between Ain and Dara was absolutely amazing. And I'm sure you're going to enjoy this event as well. So without further ado, I'll just uh, tell you about Clodagh. Claude has been working at the Museum of Country Life for a long time. She's working with the Irish Folk Life Collection of the National Museum of Ireland since 1995. And she's now based in Castlebar here in County Mayo. This is the fourth site of Ireland's National Museums. Claude has a degree in Irish folklore and archaeology, and her MA thesis is on the subject of traditional hearth furniture. Sounds absolutely fascinating. Uh, she's cur curatorial responsibility for the calendar, custom, religion, sport and leisure, childhood textiles, ceramics and glass collections. Claude has worked in the National Museum of Ireland Dublin sites and she played a pivotal role in the inception, development and installation of the National Museum of Ireland Country Life and the move of the Irish Folk Life Collection to its new store and galleries in County Mayo. Claude has curated much of the permanent galleries displays and over 30 temporary exhibitions. Is a love for folklore, ethnology, objects and the museum and Claude was appointed keeper of the Irish Folklife Division in 2020 and we're absolutely delighted to have Claude here. Um, uh, the title of Claude's talk is Masks and Mischiefs, uh, Irish Halloween Traditions and I suppose Ireland is the home of the Festival of Sound so I think it's very appropriate for us to have this uh, talk today with Claude. So I'm just going to play a little intro video for you now in a moment and then I'll hand it over to uh, Claude. Well, listen, thank you very much. And um and um Gurmaig Agus um Tokwalt Yro Gahan then a Taigesh that no again a gunker on um on Skyland. Um so it's Iha Hauna and it's going to be Halloween is just here and Iha Hauna is tonight. So um this is a really really great to be actually giving a talk on the actual day itself. Um so just to say that um the reason I'm going to look at why we actually um, celebrate um, Halloween the way we do, and then I'm also going to have a look at the history of it, and then probably look at the games that we all played, and I'm sure that everyone remembers playing, and then have a look at the masks and that tradition, have a look at the lantern tradition, and um, and then just kind of the mischief involved, and. So I'm going to show you a lot of the images from the museum collection, but I'm sure a lot of people in Mayo have been to the Museum of Country Life where I work, and there is a display of Halloween material there. Um, so just to start, why, why Halloween and why is it important? And strangely enough, it's a quarter day. We're going to talk about the quarter days. And the first day of each season is the first of day of spring, is the first of February, first of May, first of day of summer, the first of 
August first day of that be Lunasa and the start of autumn and really then it's the first of November and the start of winter and that's such an important time in the calendar but it has this festival Samhain it means Samhain is a word that means end of summer and it goes back to much more ancient and pagan times to the time of the Celts and so it's over 2000 years old and as a festival and sometimes the places where it was celebrated had even evidence of being um, like fires and bonfires um, on hills like the Hill of Ward show much more earlier than that, um, earlier than 2000 years ago, there would have been evidence of fires there. So I suppose it's a very ancient festival. And um, when you think of the Celts, they actually believed in another world and the world of the dead and the fairies and spirits and you know there was a different it wasn't that people died they just actually went to another world and this dark festival it was they believed that the world and um, the calendar year was divided into two halves the first half being the dark days and the second half being the bright days so the first of november was actually the start of their new year and they put the darkness before the light and they would have actually had bonfires would have been part of that tradition and actually an association with the dead as well. So, um, but a welcome association with the departed um, of your ancestors and family. So just to kind of um, look then about the why, I'd, I, why would we celebrate it on the 31st and not the 1st? And the reason bus behind that is that people really believed that the the evening before was always the time of the festival. So when you think of even Bridget's Day, it's never the 1st of February, it's always 31st of January, and no, none more so than Halloween. It's so important that's the eve before, because the evening before the day is really, really important. And it's almost got lots of potential and super in terms of superstition and belief there is a real belief that this is a time that's not quite one season not quite the other so you're at a time where you're not we're at a time even just today that it's not actually we're not quite in autumn but we're not that yet in winter so there's this kind of in between time and that in between time is when you're much more in touch with the supernatural the other world and the idea that the the people and, and um, different beings would be able to move between these two worlds. So we can move to the other world and they can move back. And so there's this sense of belief and also we can define our future and we can define our future around this time. So we have access to kind of what our future holds and another world there. So just to say that, um, what we're also looking at, it is a festival traditionally associated with death. And you think about it as well, that there's a lot of death on the land. Everything's dying. And it's also an end of harvest festival. And the end of the harvest, you've got everything in. You've foraged everything from the land. You've got every berry that you're going to pick. You've got also, you've got the um, all the apples and fruit are in. And all of the other crops have been taken in much earlier. But this is pretty much the end of everything that can be taken in. And there's a lot of death on the land and um and then there's also the there's there's death on the land but also a lot of these um a lot of the objects that we associate with halloween are some of the fruits that have come in and certainly the apples um now because the we were pagan and then we were christianized um christianity knew that we'd never really take it up if uh, if we didn't if it wasn't made easy for us so we have our feast day the feast of all saints is um tomorrow the first of november and then the next day strangely enough happens to be the feast of all souls so i suppose that the christian church realized that we were going to celebrate anyway and there was a celebration and and remembrance of our dead and so it's all combined into halloween and all put very close to this time so Samhain, as I said, means end of summer, and we call it Iha Hauna. But when you think of all saints, saints are the holy ones um, with halos, and hallowed ground is holy ground. So all saints is tomorrow, and hallow, and that's where we get the word hallow for Halloween, and Ean is evening. It's just a shortened version of the evening. So Halloween is the evening before all saints, and uh, 
And so that's kind of where the word comes from. And as I said, Samhain is an ancient word for after, um, for the end of summer. And it is going back to one of the earliest second century. There's a, a, Cel a Celtic calendar, which shows that there is, um, you know, that there was a calendar and the calendar would have, would have looked at the full year, but also um, you'd have in bulk, which is Bridget's Day, Bealtaine, um, Bealtaine, Lunasa, in August and then Samhain in November. And the thing about um, Samhain and um, Bialtana, they, they're very similar and a lot of the traditions are very similar. Both their times were extremely superstitious times and, a, and an, an extreme feeling that the other world was very close by. The fairies were moving in, in Halloween time, the fairies are moving from their summer dwellings to their winter dwellings, they're on the move. Then they could have the spirits of the dead would be welcome to come home. So there's a sense that they could be on the move. The puka could be out and other spirits and sp uh, could be going about. So there's a real sense that you actually have to you realize that all these other world beings are around at this time. And often people, because of that darkness and the light of the sun and the waning of the sun, it's very much associated with, it was always very much associated with bonfires, but so is Bealtaine, Bealtaine, which means bright fire. Um, so just in terms of the festive fare, and if, if anyone hasn't decided what to eat tonight, I think the, the traditional meal is actually more vegetarian and it is Kulkanen. And uh, so that's your very nice mashed potato. There's an awful lot of melted butter in that picture, but um, melted butter, cream, potatoes um, and cabbage being the other ingredient. And actually on display, we would have the big black cooking pot and the cabbage chopper and there's a wooden kind of we call it a beetle like a mallet or a, it's a, a pounder and that is actually for pounding potatoes um, and so another drawing of our potato pots and our three-legged pot and the cook cannon with the cabbage on top. So I suppose one of the main things that most of us will remember that nuts and apples would have featured in the festive fair and very much would be important. Um, and, you know, there's some really great photos and you'll probably see loads of them and recognize the same children because they were taken um, in 1935 by Morris Curtin in Dublin in, and um, they're on the National Folklore Collection in UCD and they're on the dukas.ie um, website. Um, but anyway, in terms of what you have on the table, it's always going the festive fair always included the apples and nuts. It's not like the sweets and the, the were really included. And um, so then this is our Halloween display. And you know, not just do you eat the harvest items, conkers and nuts, and there's there's things made out of um, apples and nuts. Like there's um, necklace of chestnuts there, and there's different things. So just to realize that the apples feature very strongly, that's a lovely bone carved apple core. And when you had as much of the apple stored, of course, most people wouldn't have had fridges. So you had to find ways to preserve them, make the jams and the crab apple jellies and jellies and different things you could do with apples. And then there was plenty left for games. And I'm sure everyone remembers babbin for apples in a basin of water and then trying with their hands behind their back and trying to get the um, trying to get either coins or apples out. And uh, and every early picture of Halloween always shows bobbing for apples. And no matter what, everyone's getting soaked and um, trying to get the apples. Um, the book of days there. And just one of our, uh, one of our buckets. Um, and just in 1935, they're just d bobbing for apples again. And, you know, I just, I'm sure it brings back a lot of memories for so many people, um, knowing that they, it's exactly what everyone did. Again, the snap apple night is another name for it, 1833, Daniel MacLeese's painting there. And um, again, more bobbing for apples, the traditional. Um, and then, of course, apple on a string. And most people will have remembered doing this and, you know, that it really is something from most people's childhood, um, trying to get the apple and trying to get a bite and two people working very hard at it and trying to catch it with their teeth. Um, and yeah, so there's, it, and that's still something that we're all, we all have done and we probably always do with our children. And it's amazing that these games survive and they keep going. Um, 
So the um, you have to just get the apple and not let it fall. But it was a little more dangerous. <laughs> and thankfully, this part from a health and safety um, point of view has gone out the window. So it wasn't that just it was a cross of two sticks of wood were made. And then this was hung from the ceiling, two apples at either either end of one arm of the cross and the other end had two lit candles. So as it swung dangerously, it must have I wouldn't have thought it was very funny to get your your hair singed or whatever you know and it did seem quite a dangerous thing but that actually was very traditional as well and um, so thankfully we just moved to just one apple on its own um, and just one of the features of the night happens to be about marriage and marriage divination divining that you're going to get married it was really important to get married and traditionally it was very important to the community that people married because it was the continuity of the community. And when we think of the deserted village in Ackle, things villages don't get deserted if people just keep on marrying and having kids. So there was a real sense that it was very important to get married and it features so strongly. And also when you're coming into winter, you haven't as much to do. So it would be very nice to kind of start the courting at this stage. And so maybe you could be married by Shrove Tuesday, the most favourable day of the year to marry before Lent started. So you might be busy at this time of the year around Halloween night, but you really are trying to figure out what's my future. And this is the time because it's open time and the supernatural time. And we, we, can, we can capture the other world and also what our future holds. Um, I know my mom used to do this all the time, whether it was Halloween or not. Every time we peeled an apple, we let the, the, the peeling um, of the skin be exceptionally long and thin. And then of course, threw it over the shoulder and tried to figure out, did it have an initial? And that would be the initial of the man you were going to marry. And so I'm sure a lot of people did that and not, maybe not just on Halloween. And um, um, so that was something that people would have actually um, done. And there might've been a St. Simon, St. Jude upon the eye intrude by this pairing, I hold the, uh, to discover this day, the first letters of my own true lover. So there might've been a thing to say and when you threw it over your shoulder. Um, but anyway, um, there's only so many letters that can be made with the squiggly, um, the squiggly peeling, but funny and certainly a traditional thing to do. But also on that night, a lot of people really believed that they were going to see the man that they would marry. And there seemed to be a huge amount of tradition about, you know, combing your hair in a looking glass and then looking in at maybe at the stroke of midnight and looking over your left shoulder. And then you might see an apparition or a, a vision of the man that you're going to marry taking a mirror outside and looking at the moon might determine who, how many times or how many people, how many, not how many times you're going to marry, but how many um, years it will be before you get married. And, you know, people would go and often they'd, they assume they're going to dream of their husband and um, the future husband. So there's a huge amount. It's almost like this is much more traditional for us um, than even Valentine's Day. Um, so let me just go back to this. Um, so then, of course, there's nuts as well. And, you know, there was also games where, you know, you put a lighted flame between between two nuts on the on the flagstone of the fire or near the fire. And um, if the nuts jumped apart, then you weren't going to have a very successful marriage. If they came together um, cautiously, you you might get married because you'd give your names, the names of your nuts, um, the names of the nuts, you give them your own name and the name of the man you wanted to marry. And then you'd know if they jumped together, towards the flame of love, then future happiness was yours. <laughs> so, but that may, that is a very traditional thing to have the nuts and um, moving them together. But what we all remember and pretty much associate um, with Halloween, I'm very sure is the, is the barn rack. And although you can run out to Tesco, Aldi, Super Value, Lidl and get your barn rack, um, a lot of people would have made this traditionally themselves. And um, speckled is brack, that means speckled. And and barn is the type of cake it is and um, so the boring brack would have had the ring in it and if you got the slice with the ring it determined that that you that was you who got it and that you were the person who was going to get married within the year but not only was the barn brack there and we have
have some rings like pig rings they wouldn't have been fancy gold rings and um, but we also have a they might have been in the Kilcannon if you might have found the ring so it isn't just in the barn back there could have been rings in other places so you didn't lose out too much um but you could have all these other things in the barn back. The thimble would mean if you got that, you were going to be a spinster for the rest of your life. A button meant you were going to be a bachelor. Um, if you got the crucifix, well, you'd be taking up religious orders and you could get a rag or a pea and that would mean you were going to be poor. You know, there could be um, a coin in it for richness. And then if there was a stick in it, it meant you probably were going to be beaten by your spouse. So there was a lot of things in it that actually, a lot of things you were guaranteed to get something, but not quite the nice things. Um, but getting the ring was the prize item to get. And the, um, but also, you know, there was lots of games as well, like, um, this one, steal a head of cabbage, put it over the door. The first man to enter in the morning is supposed to have the, the name of your future husband. And a lot of games with blindfolding. Blindfolding, the girls would go out to the field, pull up a cabbage and, uh, you know, pick a cabbage and the, determined by the one that they actually picked, depending on what size it is, how bald it is, how much soil was left on the roots that would indicate plenty of money, you know, if that was the case. So there's a lot of traditions of, you know, as if the cabbage will actually detect, dictate your future husband. Um, and also there's the, you know, fine um, going to bed with kind of having eaten salty um, salty food like salted herrings or something and um, you, if you had done that you would deliberately do that go, just before you go to bed and then you dream about your future husband arriving with a glass of water and um, the future spouse would come during the night in your dream or give you the glass of water some people took the first and last of their dinner and their supper and put it into under the bed and they dream with the person they were going to marry could have been very messy a lot of the time there was also putting two black snails and you would put these snails um down in near the ashes or in a tray with ashes from the fire and the next morning you would expect to um that they would have left a mark in the ashes and that would show the initials of the man the future spouse husband or wife um so there's a lot of that um yeah just move to the next one you could cut nine stalks of yarrow with a black handled knife of course and um and then put them onto your pillow and dream of the person that you're going to marry and then the same with some ivy and nine leaves of ivy i place under my head to dream uh, of the living and not the dead to dream of the man i am going to wed and to see him tonight at the foot of my bed um so yeah so there's a huge amount of just um huge amount of um the kind of this divination and believing that you're going to see your true love so there's awful it, there's an awful lot of cards associated with halloween but they're much more recent and very much come from america but it is that our tradition goes out goes across with irish emigrants and it goes to north america and they take the traditions of halloween with them um, another determine in your future, which was the blindfold, putting three saucers, maybe four saucers out, but one that one has a ring in it. One one might have clay, or some um, some one might have clay, or one might have um, water in it, or one might have grain or meal, and then those plates and saucers were switched around and if you were the if you put out your hand and you got the one with water, it meant you were going to emigrate and go overseas it meant that you know you get the ring you'd marry and you know grain you'd be rich but I mean if you put your hand in clay that wasn't obviously boding very well for your future which is very sad for <laughs> thankfully that isn't really traditional uh, as much a game played well not maybe not with the clay um so but you know these games are still around and it's good to keep doing them um and uh um, yeah, so there's a lot of games that we know, and maybe you remember Cherry on the Flower. It's called Shaving the Friar, and it's a big putting a pyramid of flour and maybe a cherry or something on top, and everyone has to take a slice. And it's a bit like Jenga, whoever eventually, whoever lets it fall and the cherry actually falls, they lose, you know, and they have to put their face into the flower. So that's uh, another um, traditional game. Um, we have a lo lovely we have lovely necklaces made out of rose hips and dried rose hips and a few necklaces we've ne 
necklace is made out of chestnuts and there's one on display. But also conkers would have been a traditional game for the lads and I'm sure a lo load of boys will recall playing with conkers and trying to have the hardest of conkers that would actually bash the the, the other conquerors, uh, the other oppo your opponent's conquerors would uh, conquer would break. So there's lots of great images of the the conquerors. All oh, this is from the Hulton Getty Archive, 1952, and that was from my Cullen Heritage. The boys playing with conquerors, and I did notice that in Freshford in County Kilkenny they have the Irish Conquer Championships. <laughs> so, um, so that with the, well they did a few years ago anyway, and um, so conquerors would have been a feature, but certainly after Halloween and. Um, and so then I just want to move on to protection. And we did say that you have to protect yourself. You're kind of familiar with the other world, but there was an awful lot of blessings and holy water. And even though this feast day, festival is associated with pagan in origins, there's an awful lot of holy water. Places were blessed. Everything was blessed. Anything that moved was blessed. The animals were blessed. The buyers were blessed. The home, the family, everything blessed with holy water. Um, a friend of mine, Alice Marr, said she was sent out to bless all the gaps in the outside so that there was gaps between fields, just in case other world beings were there, just to protect them. So protect yourself and protect your family. So there would have been that idea of needing to protect yourself from supernatural, from the fairies, from the other world, because they could be up to mischief and you never know what could happen. So I suppose the important thing was to, to look to to, for protection and Thanksgiving and you would make a Halloween cross and we have some wonderful crosses from Eris in County Mayo on display and also some from Ladderfrack in County Galway and Halloween crosses it is kind of unusual I mean we bridge crosses from absolutely everywhere in the country but we have only Halloween crosses from a few places in the west so it is an interesting aspect of the tradition and maybe it just survives longest in in the west um so these are Halloween crosses, oh, some from me as well, actually, and Claire. So, um, but, um, you know, it does seem to be that Halloween crosses, that's the one from Eris, and it is on um, display. And, um, Barthra. And so that's our, some of our collection on display, just simple crosses, but again, associated with Halloween and looking for protection. A lot of the time, the countryside was a really dark place, especially before electricity, and you would have had lights. A lot of the time, people didn't have candles as much because it would they would waste quite quickly. And rush lights, rushes dipped in, you know, animal fat or goose fat or any type of fat would have been lit at either ends. And a lot of our candle holders wouldn't just hold a tallow candle, they'd also have um, space for rush lights. So as you can see, this is the light of the candle. Why did you light your candle, especially at Halloween? You put one in the window to really, um, to kind of make sure that any of your departed um, family could come back and they'd feel welcome. So there was a light in the window for them to find their way. And I said that it was associated with the other world, but the people were very careful around at certain times. Rathcrohan near Tulskin County, Roscommon, on the Gyat, the Cave of the Cats, but it was associated with the other world and a, almost an entrance into the other world, but also that the other world beings would come out and emerge at Samhain. So to be really careful on this night. And people didn't really travel too much. They were kind of worried about traveling. Also, they knew that the puka was out and the puka was urinating is, uh, but often I think people say that he spat on every all the berries on the 31st of January. And the idea was that that was really to make sure that as well, that that story was told to every child to know, do not eat berries that even if they look nice after the 31st of October. But of course, the berries, they feature in the jams and all the preserves. And then they also feature in a lot of the, the cakes and there'd be apple tart and anything else with fruits and berries would be very much a feature of Halloween night. And um, so the, you know, the fairies, would, I did say they were moving their, from their summer dwellings to their winter dwellings. So you really didn't want to get in their way either, you know, and you had to be very careful as well on Halloween night. 
if the puka, sometimes the puka was the spirit that people believed could take on the shape of a, maybe a horse or a bull, a wild, a wild animal, or maybe a puck, a goat. And, um, but basically it might take you up in the air if you're coming home late at night, maybe from the pub, they'd kind of take you up on its back and bring you on a wild journey around the country and then possibly dump you where they found you, which probably isn't too bad. And you probably wouldn't remember much of the journey, but you knew you'd been, you'd been taken by the puka. Um, a man called Pat O'Hara, uh, he was in their creative writing group in the museum and it was in Samhain at this time it, um, five years ago and he said his poem was Eha Sauna, stay in, stay in, the dead cavort outside, no place for humans, devilment and devaliath abound, they're crapping on haws and slows and dams and dead hordes back for an otherworldly stagnite, distracting us from the mundane. I think it's a great uh, one and we know we'd see our slows and berries all drying up now. But there was the belief that the souls in purgatory, anyone who was in limbo might still be able to come back and visit. And there was this belief that you'd leave the fire up for them and maybe have some food out for them. And um, and then, of course, because people believe that there was an awful lot of ghost stories told on Halloween night. And also people, why we wear masks is because people wanted to scare their neighbors. And this is a very scary mask. It's made out of rabbit skin and it's pretty, pretty awful. It's from, it's from Mayo actually. Um, but it's, you know, it is a very scary mask. And the thing is, if you did want to scare your neighbors and this, and everyone was quite aware that it was a really scary time of the year. Um, and people were aware that people were quite nervous that night. So people did go from house to house or wear masks or jump out at people near the graveyard and they'd be in strange. So it was a kind of the mischief of the night was to wear a mask and get up to divilment because nobody knew who you were. Um, so we have a lot of different types of masks, some from Leitrim, from Wicklow. And, you know, a lot of the time they're sent in from school the teachers after, um, but most of the time they're homemade. And a lot of people remember making their mask or their witch's hat and, or their black bag costume or whatever you dressed up as a ghost. And, but these are lovely uh, masks this one has some wool on it and um, then we've cardboard masks from 1950s Leitrim and um, then some of them are made of flower bags and known as fiddle faces um, in around the Wicklow area, Ike Fiddle in Yelga. And uh, and then this one is from Eris and, you know, it's pretty scary. Actually, it's pretty scary because I think it has an inbuilt nose, whereas other ones that have an empty hole for the nose don't seem half as scary as this one. And it's got brilliant sheep's wool for the eyes. So, but it is pretty scary. This is another one that's really interesting because it's got um, coconut fire used to make the scary eyebrows and the um, the moustache. Um, and the coconut fibres in Wicklow in 1956, they seem to be very hairy coconuts. I don't think the coconuts I've even seen in the supermarket today have as much um, fibre on them, but that actually is the fibre, which seems quite exotic in 1956 in Limerick, or in Wicklow, sorry. Um, so horse hair was another feature as well, and these are made out of horse. This one has the, the beard and schmig from horse hair. Um, but of course, you could just paint onto your flower bag or your cotton or your fabric or um, or use, and certainly sheep's wool seem to feature quite strongly. Um, but we've had some mask making in the museum and cardboard and paint just work just as well. And of course, I don't think in the last 40, 50 years, our masks were very politically correct and they've become so more so now. But masks would have been, plastic masks would have been worn from the 40s and 50s in, and available in towns and cities. Um, and even 1935 Dublin, these ones were on, um, these were, you know, um, when people say help the Halloween party, uh, or maybe they might go to the house, the kids would go to house looking for a treat. Um, so that's the, tr the treat. Um, Halloween knock, a penny stock, if you don't let me in, I'll knock, knock, knock. If you haven't got a penny, a halfpenny will do. If you haven't got a halfpenny, then God bless you. And of course, a lot of people would say it helped the Halloween party and just got what they wanted. And um, so the thing is, going from house to house was very much part of the tradition and um, and getting a few treats. But if you didn't, um, if you didn't, um, if you didn't get treats or if you knew, well, you weren't going to get a treat, then you'd be up to mischief. And these were the people you would target um, to play a trick on. But 
the museum actively looked for masks in around the 40s and 50s and people came back and said no we're not wearing masks or they don't they don't wear masks like that at, at this time in different places you know they hadn't seen people masking and other places had the tradition but that tradition of going from house to house is something that our kids have done but of course not this year and it's the boys dressed up in masks and some of them dressed up as old hags and they put on women's hats and blacken their faces with soot and go around with false faces, go from house to house, play a bit of a tune. And um, and then they get by um, a woman in Bell Camp in Dublin in 1938. So the guising tradition of going to, from house to house is very, very strong, as you can see on the map there, mainly on the East Coast. And that's because we go from house to house a lot of the time on the West Coast. It's because the Wren is such a, a traditional time for going from house to house um, and since Stephen's day. So in the West, that's particularly strong, whereas it wouldn't be in the East. But guising in the North was very strong. And in the southeast as well so we kind of making a bit of a rabble and kind of like just banging with the staff and you know and we actually have a staff from advisor staff from um from Wicklow it's up at the top there it's hard to hard to see but basically it might have a bell or two on it and some colored ribbons and you know banging your staff and saying we're here and we're going to make a bit of a a, a, a racket and they play a bit of music and probably put out our caps and get some money and and have buy a few things so there's paper and ribbons and crepe paper on it and it came in in 1956 from the Vale of Clara in County Limerick sorry County Wicklow and um it is it's advisor staff and um and it came in via the Irish Folklore Commission and um but then on the RT website um RT archive site if you look in 1982 there were there's great um there's great film footage of the visors and and actually there's a really good RTE um gallery of different um pieces of um film footage associated with Halloween over the years but one of them is these geysers and visors and um they're called the wizards and they're in 1982 and where are they the Vale of Clara the Balnaclash Rathdrum County Wicklow and the exact same thing still going on um now to turn up lanterns why the lanterns this is our scary turn up lantern and I have to let you in the secret it's not a turnip it's a it's a plaster cast of the turnip although it's become quite famous all over the world and people wonder how we conserved this so so well um but actually it's a plaster cast so it came in by the Irish Folklore Commission and in UCD Shauna Sullivan would have wrote to Michael Dignan in the museum and she, he said a turnip up ni hey cor the year eh so it's this is an a turnip for you but it isn't for your dinner and uh, and he explains that it came in from um Rose e. Brennan Brennan and she was in Ballyan Finna in Fintown in Tyrconnell in Donegal and she had sent in this turnip and it, she had made it and carved it in the way that it had always been carved as she knew as a child and it goes and she knew that 40 years before so 19 three this was the type of the way she would have carved her turnips so um the he they said um shauna sullivan said i don't know how you're going to preserve this but you might be able to do that but anyway this is your present for christmas so that's our ghost turnip um but we also have um and the model of it was made by um a woman called miss barnes and she made plaster cast in 1943 and um so it's really amazing that we have it and that it came in but we, uh, but this is 1979 in zurich in switzerland so throughout europe there is a lot of carving of turnips and um, these are really particularly scary and um, when you think about how happy the pumpkin is um our, our pumpkin our turnips are pretty scary lanterns and um, they're they shrivel up and they they don't look as kind of pleasant as the um the pumpkin but we would have carved turnips and we would have carved large potatoes and made faces from them and if you went to a bonfire you would have brought back some of the embers of the main bonfire to your own home or and you would have brought ashes from that bonfire and spread them over your land so that's the idea of the protection but the lanterns were scary and you would have maybe put one at the end of the gate just to ward off any evil and scare people away and 
then we would have potato faces as well, little lanterns made out of potatoes, small little candle behind them or a light. But turnips were very traditional and they are part of um, the, they are part of our tradition because we did not grow the crop of pumpkins. Um, but of course, our, we've sent it off to America and the Irish emigrated and they went to North America and they brought that tradition with them. But now it's come full circle to us because they realised how easy it was to carve a, a pumpkin rather than a turnip. It's come full circle and now we're carving the pumpkins rather than the turnips. Um, it was a knife for mischief and for going around and these were the tricks. And of course, people would often call it cabbage night and there'd be kicking cabbages all down the streets. And I know that even happened in places in Casabar and other places in Mayo. Um, but the, the idea of it being the cabbage night and then kicking the heads of cabbage, going around the place, maybe throwing cabbages at doors and, you know, um, and then the people get a big fight at the hood of a door. And of course, you know, and then they come to the door and there's nothing there except a, a rolling around a cabbage, which could look like a, a kind of a, a lone head. Um, so it probably is very scary in the dark to have cabbages thrown at your door. And when you think of how dark it is in the countryside, certainly you needed your lantern. Um, and by the way, they would have often brought lanterns down and put them near the graveyard and maybe, you know, jump out at people who might be walking around and then just jump out and scare them, especially with the lantern but our turnips look very much more like skulls and um, they would have used the inside of a, a, a cabbage and they would have sometimes filled it with um, filled it with nasty old fire and different things and have it stinking and smelling and put it up to somebody's door and you know these would be horrible tricks the Amlish, um, Amlish night around Waterford it was known as and it was going alms, looking for alms, going from house to house looking for money and if you do, didn't get it you probably were going to tr cause um, to to actually play the tricks. Um, so, and like boys and girls going in large groups, shouting, banging pots, blowing horns, visiting the cemeteries, calling at houses, seeking a welcome and if they were dissatisfied they'd be playing tricks just tying the doors blocking the chimney tipping over water barrels painting the animals with whitewash so there's a lot of things that there was a lot of mischief and that's probably the tricks if you don't get the treats um and then the bonfires and as i said you a lot of people in the west of Ireland won't associate it as a bonfire night but it's certainly much more popular in the east and so were the May the May bonfires more popular in the east it's just the St John's Eve again it's the eve before the feast day of St John the Baptist which is 24th of June so it's the night before the 23rd of June is the time where most of people associate with bonfires in the west and whereas in the east they were and certainly in the cities, the large cities like Limerick, Dublin, Washford, there was a great association with bonfires. And, you know, in Dublin, certainly bonfires in the 70s, they were a huge affair, especially in housing estates. And, you know, kids were bar kids were building the bonfires and I'm sure they were in the West for the midsummer for the St. John's Eve. It's just, the, it's the tradition is kids are so busy building bonfires for about two to three weeks, gathering all the stuff. And then they're, they're looking after their bonfire in case other people from the rival estate or community come and steal their material for the bonfire. And of course, it's just a massive thing that kids do. Um, but the bonfire tradition goes back. The Hill Award near Athboy in um, in County Meath is is said to be the great fire of Samhain was lit on that top of that hill, and all other fires at Samhain were not to be lit until the the Samhain fire at the Hill of Ward in Athboy, where there's now a Puka festival um, as part of Fulch Ireland's festivals associated with Halloween. But certainly this is this great Samhain bonfire and um, and this going back to Celtic and Druidic times. Um, so bonfire is very much part of that tradition. And, you know, it, it they're about the sun, looking to the light, looking to, to kind of looking through the sun and almost replicating the solar light in the sky. And especially it's almost defying it by actually and looking to defy that the, around the winter time, as you see the sun so low in the sky and so 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 little there, then having your bonfire is a way of saying, you know, well, look, we are strong against this. We will get through another winter. This is about us as a community going through and protecting ourselves for another year. Um, 
and the great bonfires where the tires and everything is and everything else would be in it. I think there's a black bin I can see in one of those ones, <laughs> but plastics. I don't know if anyone, I just put this in towards the end now because I don't know if everyone remembers, some people might remember when you learned Irish, there was kind of, we called it the Bunthus folklore. I don't know what why we called it that, but anyway, there was these cardboard black, cardboard pieces and they were put onto Velcro was on the back of them and they were stuck to a black piece of velvet and you just had to know the words for things and this is the Halloween bits and and then there's the ring the 10p coin you know the barn rack with the ring and all of these would have been kind of pictures to instigate the the ideas and the the vocabulary and to learn your vocabulary canoana Fawn, yeah, um, and uh, and just um, boring brack and all these things, and you'd know about the words and you'd learn your Irish folklore that way. Um, so that's it. Um, thank you, and Gormila Maigiv, and Banach the Nisauna Erbsha Ligalair. So thank you. And if anyone has any questions, I'm going to stop sharing and go back to um, Carol. Yeah. Hi, Claude. That was absolutely fantastic, I have to say. Really, really enjoyed. I'm feeling very nostalgic here. But we had some nice comments there in the um, chat. I know Peggy O'Brien wants to say that if she got the stick in the barn brack, that uh, you would beat your life partner if you got the stick. But it didn't mean you, you actually beat them. It meant that you would outlive them. I know there's Nora and Jed remember putting their na sister's nail varnish. Well, obviously, Nora had her own nail varnish, but Jed was using the sister's. And nail varnish on the conkers to harden them. And Terry Mosley, who spoke to us earlier, put concrete in the conkers. I don't know what he was doing, but that was his. But look, it was a really fantastic, especially for Halloween night, it was an absolutely fantastic um, talk. I really enjoyed it. I want to thank Claude. I know she can't come back to pity. But thanks very much, Claude. We really enjoyed it. And we, I'd encourage everybody to go to the Museum of Punch Life when all this lockdown is over, because there's obviously some fantastic exhibits there for us all to see. So thanks again, Claude, I really enjoyed it.